China's debt to GDP ratio is now over 300%. So this Reuters article came out. Okay, the stream, the stream's working. It was delayed there for a second or two. You don't need to worry about that. So this Reuters article came out yesterday. China's debt tops 300% of GDP now, 15% of global total, according to the Institute of International Finance. As Beijing steps up support for the cooling economy while trying to contain financial risks. So without support from the Chinese government and the People's Bank of China, which is their central bank, without intervention and QE programs and stimulus and stuff, China would have already probably collapsed. The same, no better than the European Union or the Federal Reserve's intervention or the Bank of Japan's intervention. So this article continues, and I'll attach a link to it if you want to read it more. China's total corporate household, uh, total corporate, there's a comma there, household and government debt rose to 303% of GDP in the first quarter of 2019 from 297% in the same period a year earlier. The IIF said in a report this week, which highlighted rising debt levels worldwide. The IIF is a private global financial industry association based in Washington, D.C., while authorities' efforts to curb, this is quoting from the report, while authorities' efforts to curb shadow bank lending, particularly to smaller companies, have prompted a cutback in non-financial corporate debt. Net borrowing in other sectors has brought China's debt total to over $40 trillion, some 15% of all global debt, the report said. Of note, onshore bond issuance suggests a big pickup in borrowing by local governments and banks this year. China's economic growth slowed to 6.2%, which many people think is fake in the second quarter. Very fake. It's weakest pace in at least 27 years. Also, one of my sources told me that the Chinese economist who came out with the GDP total, that China's real GDP was below 2%. He disappeared for, he had been disappeared for at least three months. And my source said he was not sure if the guy had resurfaced or not. So um, <laughs> he put out some research saying in China, saying he was a Chinese economics professor, saying that China's real GDP was below 2%, and the guy disappeared, and no one had seen him for three months. So hopefully he's okay. Um, hopefully he did not go to a re-education camp or anything. Hopefully he's okay. China's uh, to revive investment and protect jo jobs. Beijing has been encouraging banks to lend more, particularly to struggling smaller firms. It has also unveiled billions of dollars in tax cuts and infrastructure spending. So basically, they're doing a lot of the same stuff that has gotten China to this unsustainable debt and credit bubble and the housing bubble in the first place. So they're all these Keynesians, whether it's in China, these neo-Keynesians, whether it's in China, the US, Japan, the European Union, England, Australia, Canada, very similar playbooks. Very, very few differences. Massive, when, when in doubt, just paper over things with more artificially cheap credit and um, digital debt-based fiat currency. So in the first half of this year, local government's total net bond issuance reached 2.1765 trillion yuan. The finance ministry said on Tuesday, Chinese officials have said repeatedly that debt risks are manageable overall, which goes completely against a report that was put out in March of 2018, which the South China Morning Post actually reported. I'm surprised they reported on this, that the Bank of International Settlements actually warned about Hong Kong and China's banking sectors as among those most vulnerable to a crisis because of rising debts, according to a report from the Bank of International Settlements in 2018. So they found in their report two key indicators suggesting a looming banking crisis were present in both economies in China and Hong Kong. It said in quarterly report published that looking at early warning indicators of systemic stress. So, quote, Canada, China, and Hong Kong SAR stand out with both the credit to GDP, gross domestic product gap, and the DSR, debt service ratio, flashing red. So for Canada and Hong Kong, these signals are reinforced by property price development, said the report. The two measures are different reflections of the level of debt in an economy, and the report found that they were good indicators of a coming banking crisis. So rising debts both in Hong Kong and the mainland of China are often flagged as a concern by analysts, though regulators in both jurisdictions have been taking steps to reduce them. This was 2018, and I would say that they have really not taken steps to reduce them. So... Oh, and I also have a few other sources. So I want to thank longtime listener of the show. Hat tip to Jeffrey Landsberg of Commodore Research. He's been emailing me some articles. His article got posted on Zero Hedge in the last day or two. It is 
Beijing lets one slip. Obscure data suggests China housing bubble has burst. As far back as 2013, China's macroeconomic data has been, quote, questionably smoothed at best and outright fake at worst. Whether it is trade data or aggregate production assert, uh, once asserted, China just makes its numbers up. And as we pointed out earlier this week, this month was no exception when following China's GDP, dramatic slowing to just 6.2% year over year, the slowest since record began. 1992, I think, so over 27 years, there was a delightful surprise to appease those who were wondering whether record credit injections and more easing measures than during the financial crisis had any effect at all. China retail sales and industrial production rebounded handsomely, with the former spiking 9.8% year over year, the most since March of 2018. There's just one thing, though. The entire surge in retail sales and industrial production seems to have been triggered by an almost unprecedented sudden surge in auto sales, too. Who else? The government itself, in the form of large state-owned enterprises. Think cash for clunkers on steroids. If the clunkers belong to the federal government and the new cars purchased were made by the government. So the U.S. government does the same games. General Motors here in the Washington, D.C. metro area and Ford have enormous federal government contracts. And I'm not sure if either company would have survived without those federal government contracts either. So it sounds like China's just doing more copying of the U.S., that they've done a big auto stimulus program with the federal government purchases. Yet there was one critical data set. I'm continuing with the article. It was actually released yesterday, July 18th. So thanks again for sending me the article, Jeffrey, of Commodore Research. So if you want to take a look at his other research, uh, just search him on, on um, search engines. Yet there was one critical data set in China's manipulated economic data spreadsheet, which failed to get the royal gold seek uh, excuse me, goal seek treatment, one with dramatic implications for the broader market. According to Commodore Research, Chinese June data showed that furniture sales in China totaled only 18.4 billion yuan last month. This marks a year on year decline of 14% from the 21.3 billion yuan in sales that was reported last year for June's 2018 furniture sales. This is puzzling in light of the official Chinese data, according to which the local housing market continues to hum along, firing on all cylinders with the leverage. Uh, excuse me, firing on all cylinders with the average 70 city primary market property price rising 10.5% year over year in May. Alas, that does not seem feasible when one considers that furniture sales in China have now contracted on a year on year basis for 18 straight months. What does that mean? As Commodore Research concludes, we continue to believe that there is a good chance that the ongoing plummet in furniture sales in China is pointing to a much greater weakness existing in the Chinese housing market than is generally being recognized, end quote. This could potentially be very bad, uh, excuse me, very bad news, not only for China, but the entire world, because as we explained all the way back in March of 2017, the fate of the world economy is in the hands of China's housing bubble. And if China's biggest and most resilient bubble has now indeed burst, the uh, not only is Trump about to steamroll China in the trade war, but the resulting deflationary shockwave is about to send every bond around the world into deep sub-zero territory. Um, I would add to, and this article didn't talk about this, that if these property prices are still going up and there's no furniture being bought, it means that a lot of these houses are being bought on speculation or hoping to be flipped for a profit and they're not being lived in which means that the properties are not being prop the houses or buildings and properties are not being properly maintained okay that's important that's a if you study china and watch a lot of these chinese videos and speak to people who have visited china they notice that a lot of things whether it's buildings cars houses apartments um even elevators and buildings a lot of chinese people do not want to spend the money to maintain things like this and this is important if you're a real estate investor you need that cash flow from a tenant or property either you sell the property or if you have a tenant for rental property you need that cash flow from the t the tenant that's renting the property to reinvest and maintain the property and th it definitely sounds like this is not happening. There's also a lot of visual evidence with video of a lot of empty homes in China, over 50 million, according to some estimates, over 65 million, according to a few estimates. And uh, buildings are falling apart sometimes even before they're finished building. So a lot of empty buildings and these properties are not being maintained, which is something that a lot of people don't really talk about. You have to have a real estate background to really understand that. That just because a property is there and people are investing in it and speculating in it, it has to be in, there has to be cash flow to maintain the property. It's very important. Okay, so I read that. And one more thing here on this China update. 
So Emma, everyone remembers Emma, right, from last month, Emma Molman. She just put out a very interesting tweet about 12 hours ago. So she said, according to her sources, China Minsheng Investment Group defaulted on $500 million worth of external debt, which I guess is dollar-denominated debt, but I'd have to ask her to confirm that would be my educated guess. A first of its kind and another symptom of the cracks, gaping holes in China's financial system. Foreign investors and foreign investors in China, global bond funds beware. So that's another, this is another, I guess, financial non-bank entity. So China Minxing Investment Group defaulted on a lot of external debt. And remember, in the last couple of weeks, the Wall Street Journal ran a story that a lot of Chinese corporations and a lot of Chinese billionaires way over borrowed and they, they didn't have any experience in construction or real estate and they started moving, getting into real estate and construction a lot. So China's playing a very dangerous game with debt and credit, misallocation of capital and central planning. And normally when you get to way over 300% debt to GDP ratio, and you're running current account deficits, you start to get into those dangerous emerging market territories. So China's behavior is turning into no better than it's on its path if it doesn't fix things, which basically means, according to Ludwig von Mises, abandoning a credit bubble, which I don't think they're going to do. Cutting government spending, I don't think they're going to do because they just announced even more QE and stimulus to try to fix things. They've been doing a lot of that. That's why their stock market, which I believe crashed, I think, in November, December, too, and then it rebounded so much because the Chinese government put in eight, over $800 billion, I think, in QE and stimulus at one point, either at the end of last year in 2018 or at the beginning of this year in 2019. So China is heading towards a currency crisis at some point. They're acting a lot like a basket case emerging market now. So the gold community is going to deny this. They're going to say that because China owns lots of gold, none of this matters. But, you know, if those property values drop and we're seeing a lot of evidence now of smaller and medium sized Chinese banks and smaller and medium sized financial institutions that are non-bank in China start to have big, big problems. On top of that, there was the Wall Street, or, uh, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal article that I talked about in the last couple of weeks citing Chinese billionaires that had big debt problems now that had borrowed tons and tons of money to continue to grow their businesses, and now they were saddled with this debt and couldn't pay it back. And in a lot of cases, they'd either overexpanded their regular business or they had moved into real estate and construction trying to make extra money off that, and they did not have the expertise to do that. Suicide Van says China is essentially vendor financing the U.S. They've been over-promising and then fleecing investors since the 70s. This is correct. China has been vendor financing, but China also steals the intellectual property and research and development for free. And they also steal a ton of research from universities, from their master students and PhD students. So China, people are like, oh, the U.S. was the only one benefiting and China was giving the U.S. a belt. No, China was stealing value added, too. So the people who are saying China is in much better shape than the U.S., I don't believe it. Chinese debt, Peter Schiff uh, has incorrectly, I think he's totally wrong on China, first of all. They have misallocated many trillions of dollars in capital. This is something an Austrian school economist should acknowledge. And the other thing that Peter Schiff won't acknowledge, Peter Schiff says that China manufactures and China has a lot of savings. Not everyone in China has a lot of savings. And there's a lot of evidence, and according to my sources, whether it's the government economic data in China that is showing in the last couple of weeks that Chinese manufacturers have mass amounts of inventory build up and are having to discount the inventory to get rid of it, that, that basically confirmed what one of my China sources told me in November and December, how... A lot of Chinese manufacturers were told by their bankers that they wouldn't be called, their loans wouldn't be called in for bankruptcy and to keep producing so the factory workers could get paychecks and food. Because the Chinese bankers and the Chinese government are more worried about Chinese workers revolting than the Chinese manufacturers getting bailed out. So there's a bunch of manufacturers in China that are still producing goods, a lot of them cheap goods that no one wants, and the inventory is piling up. My source said, that particular China source told me that there was like additional warehouses being built to just put goods that no one wanted. And the inventory levels when they went into the factory to look were insane. They were just shocked at how much extra inventory there was and the workers were still producing the stuff. 
and they were having conversations with the factory owners and the factory owners were like well we have to because we're worried about the factory owners you know murdering us if we don't give them paychecks and jobs so it's a complicated situation my whole point of this is that china now has made a lot of mistakes the last 10 years okay china's in a bad position now too people are saying the u.s is in much worse shape china's in bad shape too if china would not have done a lot of this they would be in much better shape but they have as ludwig von misa says they've gone to a crazy amount of credit bubble and they're risking a currency crisis now in the next five to seven years maybe even sooner and if i think the analysis from daniel lacaye was very interesting he says that one of the ways china has been able to get away with this is the dollar peg and manipulating the exchange rate and then also the capital controls yes um i talked about their food supply problems so my one of my other china sources has been messaging me more updates on that and he he, he still lives in china and he said that even though there is shortages of pork that the government has put price controls in and the price of pork has not gone crazy high yet oh and uh next week next week i have a uh, denny mcmahon who's the author of china's great wall of debt he's booked for an interview so hopefully he doesn't cancel or reschedule but as of now he is booked for an interview next week so you will get to hear he lived in he speaks fluent mandarin he grew up in australia and he lived in china for over a decade no i did not get the adv china guys on they were traveling a lot and i sent a bunch of emails back and forth i have to check in again i almost got them on a couple times we were within a couple days of getting an interview and then they had to reschedule no i'm not going to be in chicago at the trading expo with macro voices i don't really travel that much frankly if i didn't do a lot more of these the the content lately if you guys have noticed i've done my content um increased it over fivefold in the last six to eight weeks and that's just because i i need the extra money coming in to pay more of my bills so right now i'm not traveling i wish i had more money if i had more money i would be buying more gold stocks and other things and traveling and doing nice things but things have not worked out well financially for me if i would have had a business partner a competent one for years now things would have been much easier in my life but uh things have not worked out that way the last time i thought i had a good business deal i flew down to north carolina in 2018 and someone tried to steal this entire my entire company my educational technology company business plan and my youtube channel for less than 10 grand in cash after i flew down there in good faith thinking that there was a better deal the person tried to change the terms when i tried to take a contract to a lawyer just very a lot of people nowadays are just very untrustworthy it's really sad I flew down there on my own dime trying to close a deal and then the person tried to change the terms and totally screw me over and steal the youtube channel for only a couple thousand dollars which which is not very much considering uh how much re uh how hard i've worked and the size of my channel it would take many many thousands of dollars to build a channel from scratch okay guys well that's it for right now i'm gonna go relax everyone have a good rest of your uh ha excuse me everyone have a good e weekend and if there's any more interesting stories I will potentially do another live stream show and I'll attach links to these stories in the information section. Again, thanks to Jeffrey Landsberg at Commodore Research. He's a longtime listener of the show and has been emailing me some of these articles about China. So take a look at his research work. I think it's pretty good. Okay, bye for now.